Coming up on Nebraska Stories, jazz greats reunite for a special performance. The Japanese immigrants who helped settle the Platte River Valley. A man who can turn a tree stump into just about anything. And 700 pounds of Nebraska memories. If jazz is dead, these guys skipped the funeral and just kept playing. The Nebraska Jazz Orchestra is surprised as anyone. The music didn't stop. Please uh, welcome Ed and the 40th anniversary Angio reunion band. Today's different, special. Some of the alumni who haven't played with the orchestra in decades are here to reclaim their chairs in a one night only gig. Five numbers with the blistering brass blast of vintage 70s fusion jazz. A couple of the numbers they hadn't played as a group in three decades. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The reunion band had one night to get their act together, or rather, back together. I got in the pawn shop in Omaha for 200 bucks. Returning from Connecticut, music professor and composer Rex Cadwallader took his place behind the upright piano. We're here for a kind of short, finite time to come in and say hello and, and you know, to, to relive a few moments, and that's about all the time we have. One rehearsal, 90 minutes total. 20 minutes per song if we're doing five songs, give or take a few minutes. I wouldn't have come but for the music, because it's challenging, and I, and I like that. I don't mind embarrassing myself in, in the effort to better myself. Dennis Putz Stearns, the orchestra's original rhythm guitarist, traveled from Kentucky, where he owns a llama and alpaca ranch. He got the music three days ago. Daunting. Fear is a wonderful motivator. <laughs> this isn't a story about how difficult and risky it was to get the music right. It's actually about how easily a group of old pros fell back in the groove. There you go. Perfect. One, two, one, two, three. <laughs> I take a lot of pride in the fact that the organization is 40 years old. John Tavlin founded the group. These days, he owns a jewelry store in Lincoln. The 16 musicians he assembled in 1975 quickly won over jazz fans. A lot of it is the camaraderie, particularly in, within the section. And, you know, to, to have a tight section and to instinctively know what the other players are going to do. There's a lot of pleasure in, in that kind of thing. The truly remarkable thing about this as everybody has mentioned, is the longevity of this thing. It's hard enough keeping, you know, a trio together, let alone 18 disparate individuals, for 40 years. Ed Love, the orchestra's energetic sax-playing conductor, gets credit for maintaining the group's musical heartbeat. Any musical challenge having these guys haven't played a lot? We'll find out. I mean, they've all... They're all good players. They haven't quit playing. I mean, I wouldn't have invited them back. Then, at 1.38, this is where all the trumpet players show off every note they've ever learned. He knows what he wants. No. He has very high expectations, and he, he should have very high expectations with this group. And at the same time, he's, he's very light and not heavy-handed at all, and has a wonderful wry sense of humor that always brings a laugh to the rehearsal. If Tavlin's love of high energy big band brought the group together, it was often the resident composer who gave the NJO its early voice. We were looking for rock, primarily, a little taste of, of the classic kind of classic jazz, but primarily high energy rock. It was a sound that we hadn't really ever heard before. As jazz musicians, we had mostly been exposed to the kind of big band music that our parents had listened to. For the reunion concert, 
Ed Love chose one of the earliest original pieces written for the orchestra, with an acronym for a title, SOL. I think that was the second or third thing that I ever wrote for a big band. These guys, in their generosity as young musicians, gave me the opportunity to try out a lot of things, to learn a lot of stuff. It was a huge gift to me. This speaks to an era. It's very much, in my mind, a vintage piece. It was kind of me trying to piece together a couple of different musical idioms. You remember the theme from Shaft, a little bit of that kind of harmonic feel where you get big major seventh chords and it's just kind of lush and pretty. And then that disappears and it goes back to the funk thing. It features, at one point, all the trumpets soloing simultaneously. You can really beat yourself up in big band music if you're a trumpet player. It can be a real challenge. So tight was the rehearsal schedule, there wasn't even time to run through all the solos. It's jazz. Wing it. One of the things I've learned over the years with these characters, they're a lot like symphony musicians in that you rehearse to know the music, and then you perform the music at the gig. All of the things that you do physically to play that music are still in your hands, in your muscles, but you have to find that again because you haven't done it for such a long time. When we were done, I looked over at Rex, who was sitting next to me, we looked at each other like, what was that? <laughs> we kind of both made the comment at the same time, what a rush of memories came back at hearing that music, that, particularly that tune. It, it wasn't perfect, but it's amazing how things come together. People usually concentrate pretty well on the, at the concert, so we will be all right. It'll be fun. And uh, yeah, it's, I like it. That's why you make music in general, because you're looking for those moments that, that come all too rarely when you actually achieve a kind of perfection. But sometimes that kind of perfect congruency of events and sound that send shivers up your spine. These are the guys who were there at the beginning, and this is what we've become. And I think the whole arc of it is something worth celebrating. It may be a stretch of the imagination, but I felt like an explorer discovering an unknown Amazonian tribe when I met the Nisei of Western Nebraska. In 2004, I was a history graduate student when I learned about descendants of early 20th century Japanese settlers living in the Panhandle. I decided I had to meet them. The drive west gave me time to think about our meeting. I'm a Korean adoptee. There are long-standing issues between the countries of Korea and Japan. Would they be willing to share their stories with me? But just like them, I'm a Nebraskan. Maybe our cultural backgrounds wouldn't be a problem. Roger and Nancy Sato, Mick Cara, and members of the Sakurada family invited me to a potluck supper. It was the beginning of a beautiful friendship. One of the first things they explained was the distinction of Issei, Nisei, Sansei, and Yonsei. Issei refers to the generation of Japanese who immigrated to America. Their American-born children are the Nisei. 
Their grandchildren are Sansei, followed by Yonsei, the great-grandchildren. Most Issei men came to America young and single. For the Sakurada family, their dad, Tokuzo, came to the U.S. in the first decade of 1900 when he was 18. Traveling from California to the North Platte Valley, he traded railroad work for farming a relatively new crop, sugar beets. Growing sugar beets was extremely labor-intensive to plant, tend, and harvest. This proved advantageous for the Japanese immigrants due to their excellent abilities in farming and their short stature. But even though they were allowed to work the land, anti-immigrant legislation of the day prevented Japanese immigrants from owning land. Even Nebraska was not immune to such sentiment and passed its own Anti-Alien Land Act in 1921. The law would stand until the 1950s. Many women wanting to escape their impoverished life in Japan came to America as picture brides. They sent portraits to prospective husbands living in the States. Once a mutual decision was made, they traveled across the Pacific and were met by their future husbands at the various ports of entries. There, they not only exchanged marital vows, but also their traditional clothing for Western-style clothes. But life in the new country was far from the young wives' dreams of comfort and leisure. Some children remember their mother saying, if it wasn't for an ocean separation, they would have walked back home. After the attack on Pearl Harbor, Japanese families on the West Coast were put in internment camps. Japanese immigrants of the North Platte Valley were allowed to stay on their farms because they were critical to the war effort and lived in the middle of the country. But they were monitored, had their radios, cameras, and guns seized, were restricted to 50 miles of travel and forced to carry permits. And then there was the prejudice. To avoid looking sympathetic to their former homeland, families burned or buried their Japanese heirlooms and letters from relatives living in Japan. Mick Hara's family may have been the rare exception. When the mayor of Henry, Nebraska came to her parents' home with law enforcement, Mick remembers him being sympathetic as they removed contraband items. Today, she has three items that belong to her parents. A statue, a wooden wall hanging, and a beautifully carved vase. Even while living under scrutiny, sons of Japanese immigrants enlisted in the United States military. The 442nd Regiment was comprised of Japanese Americans.
When the bombs dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, some of the Nisei remember being indifferent. That attitude changed as they learned the bombs killed some of their family members. Ted Horace said that while serving in Korea during that war, he took leave to visit his father's relatives in Japan. Ted managed to locate his aunt and her two sons. All three carried terrible scars from the bomb, and his uncle was vaporized at Hiroshima. Yet, to Ted's amazement, even while dressed in his army uniform, his relative showed no animosity. Since my first visit, I've made several return trips to the Panhandle. This past fall, I attended the annual Friendly Circle Bazaar. The bazaar is a treat for patrons. That looks like a different loop. Yeah. Because they are able to purchase homemade Japanese food. Well, I was over there talking to him, and one guy got just, he just went right there and he goes, okay, I gotta do my yearly order at the Mushi. Or the rice cake. <laughs> nice to see you. <laughs> Such as bento dinners, Moshi. <laughs> sushi rolls, as well as a variety of baked and canned goods. <laughs> there are also handmade crafts based on Japanese traditions. This is sticky no. Do you like that one? Yes. They began the fundraiser in the 1980s to pay for the upkeep of the Japanese hall. Built in 1928, it's one of the only remaining structures constructed by the Japanese community. <laughs> Many have fond memories of the hall, as it's where they attended summer school. It was a place to socialize while learning about their heritage. It was mainly time away from farm work and to have fun. As a historian, I like cemeteries. because so much information can be gleaned from the headstones. When I first met the Nisei, I was lulled into a false sense they would live forever. However, since I began interviewing them, several have passed away and I'm compelled to do something to honor them. Their story is an immigrant story. A Japanese-American story. And a rural story. But first and foremost, a Nebraska story. I was always interested in wood. It was just something I enjoyed doing. It started with a big maple tree. It was really big and I wanted to get rid of it. It just dawned on me, I'll make a mushroom. And it just happened, I did not plan. It just turned out to be a mushroom. Over the last four years, John has transformed many tree trunks into pieces of art. I want to make something that appeals to me, that's different, that nobody else is doing. He donates most of his work. When it's done, you know, I don't mind parting with it. 
John's latest projects are tributes to his lifelong idol. Well, you wonder why I always dress in black. Johnny Cash. Why you never see bright colors on my back. I joined the Army in 1962. I was 17. And before that time, I had had every Johnny Cash record that came out. It was just something, you know, I had to have them. I took those records with me to Germany when I joined the Army. During my time in Germany, I wrote Johnny Cash a couple letters, and he answered them. And he sent me pictures of himself and things like that. And I always just felt like, I, you know, that he was just like a, a friend. In 1977, he met Johnny Cash at a concert in Omaha. We sat right in the wings, right by Johnny and the rest of them playing, and they treated us like royalty. There are two things John likes to do play guitars, and make guitars. Johnny Cash had a lot of guitars. He crafted two Martin guitars. The whole time I'm working on these, I, I know that somewhere I've got to find a home for them. They found a home at the Johnny Cash Museum in Tennessee. And now he's currently working on a third. I'll just grab the chainsaw start cutting off big portions of it. I just gotta watch what I'm cutting off because I don't really know where I'm going yet. Uh, one mistake and I've just wasted all my time. The closer I get to where I'm going, the, the slower it gets and the work gets finer. Being a self-taught carver, John has learned some hard lessons along the way. A couple years back, the chainsaw slipped through a piece of the log and I took a chunk of meat out of my leg with it. I wrapped a rag around it and I furnace taped it and I went back down and went to work. Uh, another time I cut the end of my finger off with one of my rotary grinders, put it back in position, put some tape around it, and it eventually grew back. With a chainsaw you do so much of what I'm doing that you shouldn't do with a chainsaw. Pushing it into the log, using it above your head, just doing a lot of things that they're not meant for, and it's dangerous. John is giving this guitar to a friend who owns a music-themed bar. Friends and family gather to celebrate the completion of John's newest guitar. It's an honor to have something like this placed here. You know. We've had it here for a few days, and I already had probably 20 people taking pictures with it. Um, it's amazing, I can't believe it was a tree. Jim Casey, a friend of Johnny Cash, is providing entertainment. I ended up a friend of the Cash's, and he liked me because I was from Nebraska. All right, boys, let's do a Johnny Cash song. For me, celebrating Johnny Cash and being next to this big guitar, that's what you'd imagine. John was a giant, and so was his guitar. Love is a burning thing. What must have been going on inside him that was burning for him to do this, driven, is the same thing that songwriters in the 70s were after. It was a burning fire with no reward in sight. You carve that, you don't know what it's going to be, but you're going to do it anyway. Nobody does something like that. <laughs> Who in the world except you? It's what God puts us here to do. He put John here to carve that guitar. Make it look real, but much bigger than life. That's my favorite thing. When I met my wife, I was uh, into it by 12 years. When my son was born, I by 20 years. And so I'm now working on my 43rd book. Our very first date, and he said, there are two things you need to know about me. I like the color orange, and I love the Nebraska Husker football team. 
My books go through the whole season. They start with the spring ball, the fall practice, and then the season. It goes through the bowl games and the recruiting, the pro draft. So my books are one continuous story. I've been Husker football for 42 years now. When he's working on his scrapbook, there is nothing else going on. The dining room table's full, card table's full, kitchen counters <laughs> are full, and uh, we eat in the living room during scrapbook season. Probably my biggest challenge is the opponent's viewpoints. I started in 1971 when uh, Nebraska played Oklahoma. There was so much media coverage on that. And then I got to thinking that would be neat to get everybody's viewpoint. So I've got over 500 viewpoints and I haven't missed one game in 40 years. How are you today, Gail? Oh, I'm okay. Oh, good. My Sunday papers are in, so I got a couple of opponents' viewpoints today, too. I came home from school one day, and Steve was in tears. And I asked him what was wrong, and he was just sobbing, and he said, It's Tom Osborne. And I said, What? Did he die? And then Steve said, No, worse. He resigned, so that's one of my favorite. This is a special thank you for his 25 years of being coach. And then this is a special thank you to his family for sharing Tom Osmond for 25 years. And this is the result, 700 pounds of Husker history. Watch our stories online at netnebraska.org slash Nebraska Stories and go to Facebook to like us and leave a comment. Join the Nebraska Stories conversation. Nebraska Stories is funded by the Margaret and Martha Thomas Foundation, the Nebraska Office of Highway Safety, Humanities Nebraska, the Nebraska Tourism Commission, and First Nebraska Bank. Sustained funding for arts coverage is provided by the H. Lee and Carol Gendler Charitable Fund, the Nebraska Arts Council, and Nebraska Cultural Endowment. <laughs>